Well, I'm Pastor Keith. I'm lead pastor here, and it is great to have you at Living Hope Church. Um, we are continuing on in our series called I Give Up. And again, usually when someone says, I give up, it's something negative going on in their life. But I believe there are many positive aspects to the phrase, I give up. We are nearing the end of the season of Lent, a time of giving up things for 40 days. Perhaps more important than giving up the outward things, we can learn some lessons from Jesus regarding various areas of our life that we need to give up that are more on the internal side of things. Jesus modeled the truth of giving up. Week one, we talked about Jesus uh, modeling for us what is foundational to giving up various things in our life, and that is the word submitting, or, gi- or giving up his will to the Father's will. In John 4, 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then in Matthew 26, 39, which is a verse that we kind of focus in on this week, it says, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In week two, we looked at Jesus giving up superiority and pride as he ministered to those who society would say are the downtrodden or or the considered outcasts, and Jesus loved on them. Whether it was a Samaritan woman or a leper, he didn't care, he loved on people. In week three, some of you remember this, we talked about, uh, I give up my right to get even. Some of you actually walked out because you didn't want to hear, no, nobody walked out, but you probably wanted to because all of us want to get even at times. What does it mean to give up my rights to get even? And again, how did Jesus model for that? Today is Palm Sunday, and I want to pull out something out of the Bible story that talks about this event. We're not going to really look at Jesus modeling the I give up lifestyle as we have in the other weeks, but we're going to look at two things that happen in this story of the triumphal entry that speak to us about the I give up lifestyle. So let's go to Luke chapter 19, starting with verse number 29. If you have a phone and have you version, you can have the Bible on there. Also, you can go to the events and you can track the message on there as well. Verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. Surprise, surprise, right? No, not really. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, Rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. He's not referring to the rolling stones either, all right? Two things that speak to the I give up life. Both could be really messages in themselves. Number one is I give up what the Lord needs. I give up what the Lord needs. Now this week, I want you to try going up to somebody uh, and, and start to take their car or start to take their bike. And chances are they're going to say, hey, what are you doing? And simply say to them, the Lord needs it. And then I want next week, I want you to come back and tell me what happened. How did that story go for you? Call me. You get one phone call from prison or jail. Call me up. I will come and visit you and tell you that you really shouldn't have done that. But 
Can you imagine? Again, these guys are going to do this, and they're like, how's this going to work? I, I'm gonna, I could be arrested for doing this. Well, he gave them specific instructions. Well, okay, go to the village ahead of you. Step one, okay, there's a village up the road. Right as you enter it, you'll find a colt. It's tied there. Nobody's ever ridden it. Untie it, bring it here. If anybody, anybody asks why you're untying it, the Lord needs it. Again, so just try that sometime, all right? I don't know. I don't know how it'll go for you. Of course, we know that they did that, exactly what Jesus said, tying the colt, and sure enough, I imagine just sweating like, oh, no. Anybody around here, we're tying this colt, feeling like they're stealing it, and all of a sudden, somebody says, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing untying that? Okay. What were we supposed to say again? <laughs> oh, I don't know. What was it again? Uh, uh, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Wow, done deal. Just like that. No more questions were asked. The owners of the cult just kind of like, all right, go ahead, take that. The Lord needs it. Now, I wonder, did, did Jesus set this up ahead of time? Like a few days before, he said, hey, I'm going to send these guys to you, and, and they're going to need this cult, and maybe he paid them. Here's the money, I'm buying it, but I'm not telling them I'm buying it, but I'm going to send them to you, and See if they'll do this for me, or I don't know if it was prearranged or not, or were they, maybe these, the owners of the cults were, uh, the cult were also uh, followers of Jesus, and maybe they knew who this was and knew kind of what was going on. I don't know, but it's just strange how they just, they just let it go. Well, if the Lord needs it, no problem. The Lord can have it. Let me ask you, what do you have that the Lord needs? What do you have that the Lord needs? needs from you well we could say well all of me obviously the lord needs all of us it's like the story of this this little boy who uh, was sitting in church and the offering plate was being passed and he began to kind of squirm and struggle because the, I, I don't have any i don't have anything to put in the offering and he saw people putting the envelopes and stuff in there and he just again was getting uncomfortable I, I don't have anything and suddenly it dawned on him oh i know what i can do so as the offering plate was being passed he grabbed the plate he set it down on the floor and he stepped into the plate what a great picture of the Lord needs it. You have something to give to the Lord. You see, the Lord owns it all. Jesus basically tells them to get, get one of my animals and bring it to me. It was his wisdom and power that allowed the owner to exist and to have a cult in the first place. See, if I am a steward of what I have been entrusted, I am reminded again that it is his to start with. Everything I have is his. The selfish American culture has been trying to train me for 52 years to believe it is my stuff. And I get to run things in my life the way I want to. It is my stuff. I am not the only one that struggles with having to rethink so much in the Americanized Christian experience. See, the thought of dying to myself, taking up my cross today, following Jesus, it stirs my heart because it takes the power of God inside me through the Holy Spirit to help me uh, get over myself and my grip on things so that when the Lord needs something, without hesitation and without reservation, I concur with a willing heart. The Lord needs it, it's his. So many of us are holding on to everything we have in this world. It's mine, I worked for it, I'm not giving it away. But the Lord needs it. The colt's owner was a legal owner, but Jesus is the true owner. There are many meanings of the word Lord, but here the meaning of the word Lord is owner. Everything you have, he's the true owner. It's his. It's his. And when you hang on to things like this, God can never give you more things because your, your fists are like this. But when you live life like this, whatever's in your hands, you can give to the Lord. But because your hands are like this, the Lord continues to give and you can give away. And he gives and you give away. And some of it you get to enjoy as well. 
See, the right perception allows me to see things from God's side. It is all His. I'm just a steward. Opening my hand, releasing my grip on all of it, it, it's much easier once I got to know Him better. See, I know in my life, I can trust God. If God were to say to me, give your house away, there would be fear and trepidation. I'd be a little like, okay, am I hearing you, God? But if I knew God spoke to me and said that, I need to be willing to do that. When we went through the Robert Morris series, The Blessed Life, he tells stories like that, giving cars away, giving his house away, and how God supplies because he's faithful to give away. I want to encourage you in your life to recognize what is it that the Lord needs from you. And again, some of you think you might have nothing that the Lord needs. Bill Wilson, pastors in the inner city church in New York City, some of you may remember that he spoke in our church about 26 years ago. It was a long time, came for a missions convention here. Uh, some of our youth traveled out to Brooklyn and did a name trip a number of years ago. Uh, his mission field is in a very violent place. He himself has been stabbed at least twice as he's ministered to the people of the community surrounding the church. Once a Puerto Rican woman became involved in the church and she eventually gave her heart to Jesus. After her conversion, uh, she came to Pastor Wilson and she said to him, I, I want to do something to help with the church's ministry. And, and he asked her, well, what do you think are your talents? Uh, where are some things that maybe you could, you could think of doing? And, and, and she, she couldn't even speak English. But she did love children. So he put her on one of those church buses that went in the neighborhoods and transported kids to church. And every week she performed her duties. She would find the worst looking kid on the bus, put her, him on her lap and whisper over and over the only words that she had now learned in English, I love you, Jesus loves you. After several months, she became really attached to one little boy in particular. The boy never spoke. He came to Sunday school every week with his sister and sat on that woman's lap. But he never, ever made a sound. Each week, she would tell him all the way to Sunday school and all the way home, I love you, and Jesus loves you. One day, to her amazement, the little boy turned around and stammered, I, 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 I love you too. And then he put his arms around her and gave her a big hug. That was 2.30 on a Sunday afternoon. At 6.30 that night, that little boy was found dead. His own mother had beaten him to death and thrown his body in the trash. I love you, and Jesus loves you. Those were some of the last words that this little boy heard in his short life, coming from the lips of a Puerto Rican woman who could barely speak English. This woman gave her one talent to God, and because of that, a little boy who had never heard the words love in his home experienced and at least responded to the love of Christ. You might say, I have nothing the Lord needs. Yes, you do. And that one little something could make a difference in somebody else's life. What can you give from yourself? What is your cult? You and I each have something in our lives which, if given back to God, could, like the colt, move Jesus and his message further down the road. Number two, I give up my praise to Jesus. As Jesus came to the place where the, the road goes to the Mount of Olives, the crowd goes nuts and begin to joyfully praise him in loud voices. Have you ever been to a place like that where there's some superstar, somebody that's well known in the crowd just goes crazy, yelling and screaming and trying to get an autograph and trying to meet that person. Well, here's Jesus, and that's what the crowd is doing. is saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
Well, the Pharisees, they did all they could to try and stop this from happening. But eventually Jesus says, hey, if they keep quiet, the rocks are going to cry out. See, so far in Jesus' life and ministry, he's really hidden who he is from the people. Jesus had asked his disciples not to reveal his identity as the promised Messiah and King. But now in today's passage, he clearly revealed that he is the King according to God's promise. He entered Jerusalem as the king. Why did he do so? It was because Jesus wanted to fulfill God's work. If Jesus had claimed that he's the king too early, Roman authorities and Jewish leaders would have persecuted him and the message of his salvation, the message of healing, would have never gotten out. But now it was time. He knew his days were coming to an end before the crucifixion. And it's time to present myself as the king. Zechariah 9.9 talks about this. I love how the Old Testament, written years before the New Testament, points to and and is fulfilled in the New Testament. Zechariah 9.9, it was written hundreds of years ago. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now back then, it wasn't called Palm Sunday in Jesus' day, but each Israelite family would choose the lamb that they would sacrifice for Passover on the 10th day of the month. And as the people shouted, Hosanna, they didn't realize that they were now choosing the lamb of God as this sacrifice. Hosanna means save us or save. So Palm Sunday crowd is falsely assumed that Jesus was going to bring this political liberation, that he was going to save them from Rome. But he had something he was coming to do far better than that, to save them from their sins, to set them free from the penalty of sin. When the people spread branches and garments in Jesus' path, it was to pay him honor. The people were boldly declaring that Jesus was their king. An accusation eventually written in condemnation above his cross. The shouts of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord are actually words from a Jewish hymn. The phrase Hosanna and blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord both come from Psalm 118, one of the Hallel or praise psalms used every Passover. These Jewish people knew these hymns. They were as familiar to them as they are, as you are to Christmas carols. Praise. I give him my praise. They begin to praise him, and Jesus says, if they don't, the rocks will cry out. I found an interesting little article on the CBN website talking about the nature of praise, and it said, praise according to scriptures is an act of our will that flows out of an awe and a reverence for our creator. Praise gives glory to God and opens up the door for a deeper union with him. It turns our attention off of our problems and onto the nature and the character of God himself. Some of you today need to do that. Right now, your eyes are fixed on your problems. When you begin to praise God in the midst of the problems, something powerful begins to happen on the inside. When you begin to praise God that your truck and your chipper were stolen, something begins to happen on the inside, doesn't it, Troy? All right, God, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to praise you. I don't like it, but I'm going to praise you. I don't, I don't like what happened to me, but I'm going to praise you. And God begins to bust loose for you. And your perspective is put right again. And it's taken off of the problems and the issues. And suddenly, you're reflecting your praise to God. As we focus our minds on God and proclaim his goodness, we reflect his glory back to him. There are so many reasons that you and I have today to praise him. Just like some of you think you have nothing to give to God, some of you think you have no reasons to praise God. Let me give you some. Very simply, We praise God because he is worthy of our praise. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. 
He's our creator, our provider. He's our healer, our redeemer. He's our judge. He's our defender. And we could go on and on and on with who he is to us. Another foundational reason to praise God is out of simple obedience. The Bible says that God is a jealous God who demands and desires our praise. And he says, you shall have no other gods before me. I should be number one in your life. As the psalmist said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Check your neighbor this morning. Are they breathing? Their eyes could be closed, but are they breathing? If their eyes are closed, snap a picture of them and post it on our Twitter or Facebook right now. Go ahead, do that. Check in with that picture. Yeah. They're just deep in prayer. Everybody here breathing today? You're breathing? You look like you are? Nobody's turning colors, turning blue or anything like that? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It doesn't stop, or it stops. It doesn't go on to say, well, only if things are going well today. Only if the bank account is flourishing. Only if your stomach is full and satisfied. Only if all your relationships are perfect and there's no animosity, there's nothing being worked out between you and somebody else. It doesn't say that. It says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. As we praise God, we discover incredible benefits in our lives. You see, you and I were created to praise him. Now, due to man's original sin, this relationship was disrupted. Praising God is a part of restoring that in many ways. We obviously repent of our sin. We turn from our sin. We give our lives to God, but that involves praise. Suddenly recognizing that he's the one that's worthy of your praise, and you begin to sing, and not just sing. Whatever you do that puts a smile on God's face, that's praised him. That's worship to God. And the Bible says something that's really, really cool. Really cool. As we praise him, he says he inhabits the praises of his people. And he draws near when we're praising him in James 4, 8. When you feel alone, when you don't feel like you have reason to, that's the times to bust loose, to press in, and to begin to praise him no matter what you feel like. And all of a sudden you find that God is drawing near and your perspective is changing and you feel his peace and his presence and his comfort and you know that he is an awesome God and he can take care of my little minute problem that I think is just huge. To God, it's nothing. And all of a sudden perspective changes and even in the midst of the storm, you're lifting up your hands and you're lifting up your voice and you're praising God. Ain't no rock gonna take my place, friends. I'm going to be the one that's going to lift up my voice and praise him. So as we think about this passage today, I want to encourage you to look at the owner of the donkey and his response to the king who entered into Jerusalem that day. What is God calling you to do for him today? Are there ties to this world and concerns that you need to untie? What does he need of you today? I give up whatever he needs. It's all his. And I give up my praise to God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and as you're thinking about your life and what you need to give God or how you need to, uh, to praise him, perhaps there's somebody here today that you need to give your life to God like that little boy stepped in the offering plate as it went by. You need to just step in that plate too in your mind this, this morning and say, I'm giving you my life. Maybe you've never done that before. What an awesome day it would be to do that today, one week before Easter, to say, you know what? I'm gonna surrender my life to God. I want my life to bring him glory and honor. I wanna give him everything. The neat thing is he takes your sin too. He takes all the bad, all the stuff we've done. He says, I'm willing to take it. I took it to the cross. I nailed it there for you. You don't have to carry it anymore. I paid the penalty for your sin so that you can have life, so that you can have relationship with God. And I wonder this morning, before we go into communion, is there anyone here this morning that by the raising of your hands, you'd be saying, Pastor Keith, I'm surrendering my life to God fully today. I'm giving him my life. I'm asking him into my heart. Yes, thank you. you can
can put your hands on near the front. Is there anyone else? Anyone else this morning? Say, I'm going to surrender it all to him today. I want to live for him. I need my sins forgiven. Yes, thank you. You can put your hands down. Yes, thank you. Is there anyone else? Three people today. This is something I did when I was 10 years old. Same thing you're doing right now. Best decision of my life. Doesn't promise you there's never any problems. But again, you know that God is with you. He's living in you when you do that. Just a moment longer. Is there anyone else here today? All right, let's pray this prayer. This prayer is not a magic formula, just words that I use. But if you mean this, Jesus is going to come into your heart. Most Sundays I do this prayer almost always the same. And part of it is so that you, if you ever have a situation with somebody else and need to pray with them, you kind of say, okay, I have an idea of what to pray. Uh, I pray this prayer enough that my son repeats it before I say it on a Sunday morning. He's in the nursery this morning, but if he was in here, he would try to say the words I'm saying before I say them because I say them so often. He has them down. It's working. <laughs> you can do this. You don't have to be in church. You can be with a friend tomorrow and pray with them. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I do confess that I have sinned. But I now invite you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. And help me to live a life that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to invite you to meet me at the end of the service right over here by, uh, by this cross here. Just have a little gift I want to give you that's going to help you to grow in your faith in the Lord. God is good all the time. Amen. Would you stand with me t together as we uh, close the service in prayer today? Father, once again, we celebrate you and your love for us as we do every Sunday. Lord, today... Remind us again that you need us and you need everything that we have. Lord, may we be in that place in our hearts where we trust you enough to say, Father, it is all yours. Whatever you need, we give to you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that on our lips every day would be praise and worship, that we would not be as that crowd that gave praise one day and then walked away a few days later. And God, even in the midst of the storms of life, we lift up our voice to praise you because you and you alone are worthy. Lord, I pray that you would give us incredible opportunities this week as the discussion of Easter will come up many times to be able to recognize the open door that you provided to walk through that and to share the love of Jesus with those around us. Father, bless each one today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great week.